So I did, did my best to put together a little uh, tutorial here on reverse time migration. My, um, the main resource I used so far, depends on how much more you want to see, the main resource I used so far is this uh, leading edge tutorial by Sava and Hill. And uh, I got the uh, uh, slightly higher quality version of the tutorial document from Sava's website at Colorado School of Mines. And he runs a, uh, uh, a class in seismic imaging, probably uh, a bit like this one. And then uh, he does a, a two-day condensed version for, uh, for industry. So you may, uh, who knows, you may get the opportunity to take it at some point, um, his two-day version. And um, it's fairly recent uh, from, uh, from 2009. It's the Leading Edge article, tutorial. And then the, uh, there's this geophysics paper by Basil Kozlov and uh, Sherwood uh, from 83, so uh, quite early. That's where it was uh, first uh, put forward. And um, uh, then you also pointed out this very interesting uh, Karazintzer and uh, Gerard uh, expanded abstract from uh, the New Orleans meeting. So that's... Uh, uh, kind of uh, gives a, a, a little bit of a modern update to, on some of the uses. And so after today, you can tell me what you want to see a little bit more of. Um, the Sava and Hill tutorial is um, basically uh, a little uh, treatise on the, on the different varieties of wave equation migration. And the, the classification that he comes up with for these uh, rever related to reverse time migrations is based on what assumptions the algorithms make. Uh, it's based on uh, how you implement them, um, whether you implement the uh, wave field reconstruction in the, uh, the time or frequency domain, and whether you uh, um, you uh, calculate uh, forward in time or down in depth. Um, and he spends uh, some time talking about the imaging principle, or as we've talked about it from Claire about the imaging condition. Um, so we're going to look at the, uh, uh, these different sort of classifications. And, and uh, Sava's tutorial follows the, uh, the blue, um, uh, the, the darker blue types, and um, uh, and he actually mentions uh, just these uh, um, these three different kinds of uh, implementations um, rather than all sixteen, um, and those are certainly the most popular ones in industry. Um, and so this uh, tr this doesn't show all the branches of the tree. You know, this is just one thin branch of the uh, migration tree. You know, headed towards these particular implementations. And other things you've heard about are uh, uh, in gray. So the first assumption that's made is uh, essentially the Born approximation that uh, I introduced you to. Um, and this says that there's only uh, primary reflections in the in the data set. Um, so uh, Sava and Hill call that uh, single scattering. Um, and really, what you're assuming there is that there's no multiple reflections in the data set to interfere. So uh, what's done, of course, most commonly, is to uh, is to remove those those multiples. So, so that's what uh, that's really the first thing that distinguishes um, reverse time migrations from, um, you know, which is one way of of inverting the wave equation approximately. Uh, as we've discussed, it's a tomographic solution, and you know, I I've told you already how 
uh, Kirchhoff migration and Stolt migration really are uh, uh, tomographic approximations to an in inverse to the uh, uh, to the wave equation under a whole lot of assumptions. Okay, and reverse time migration uh, uses uh, almost all of those uh, assumptions, um, starting with single scattering. So, um, and that's the thing that really distinguishes uh, between reverse time migration and uh, uh, what I'm going to call uh, um, what I'm going to call um, uh, full wave inversion. Okay, the the really the point of full wave inversion, you know, whatever path it follows and what other assumptions it makes, is that uh, it's going to uh, include the multiple reflections. Okay. And, and since um, surface waves, Rayleigh waves, love waves, other kinds of surface waves, um, tube waves in, in you know, full wave data sets recorded in, in wells, um, since those, those surface waves are really a uh, you know, whole uh, added up series of, of various uh, multiple reflections, um, that means that uh, uh, you know, we're with, with without handling those and handling only single scattering. You know, with uh, reverse time migration, we're we're back to all the same um, assumptions that we've been with all through seven hundred six to seven fifty seven. Um, that we have somehow managed to completely remove all of the uh, all the surface waves, all of the multiples from our uh, from our records. Um, there's really nothing uh, here in Sava and Hill that says that you can't use uh, reverse time migration for um, um, for shear wave reflections. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, you know little discussion of of uh, of of the fact that uh, under these assumptions you have to do it one at a time. So. You know, best would be a data set that contains only shear waves, and you uh, you process that uh, by reconstructing the uh, the uh, the single scattering of shear waves. Um, and uh, uh, on the other hand, you uh, produce another version of your data set which contains only P waves and only P wave primary reflections, and you process that entirely separately. So um, that's uh, um, that's really where this uh, uh, where this comes in, uh, and the big difference between these, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, full wave inversion, reverse time migration, they use a lot of the same technology, um, and they have um, a lot of the same very very heavy computational requirements. Okay. But uh, reverse time migration makes more assumptions, uh, and thus the data has to be more have to be more carefully filtered and subsetted before um, you do a reverse time migration. Um, uh, and and uh, in some sense, uh, the reverse time migration is more popular than the um, than the full wave inversion. Because uh, you know processors are very very used to removing the multiples and uh, the surface waves from their from their data records, and um, you know they're able to make reverse time migration work very very well in areas that um, are not uh, uh, too uh, too complex. Um, so uh, uh, the most popular uh, uh, distinction uh, that's next between the wave equation solutions um, is uh, between uh, uh, is really how you the method you use for uh, reconstructing the uh, the source and receiver uh, wave fields. Okay, so. 
Um, the most popular method is acoustic forward modeling using a finite difference solution to the uh, um, to the acoustic wave equation, and that's uh, that's what uh, Sava and Hill are calling the the differential uh, type of um, uh, type of wave equation solution. Um, there are also spectral solutions, and one that you know uh, that you've used for downward continuation is uh, you know Stolt migration. You know, basically, the very simple usage of the uh, 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 of the dispersion relation, the circular dispersion relation, uh, to reconstruct a uh, a wave field at depth from recordings of the surface. That's a spectral domain um, wave equation solution. You in seven hundred six, you also played around with uh, um, frequency domain solutions that were uh, physical in in x and and z. Uh, and those would also count as uh, spectral. Um, you know, they were they were both differential and spectral. Um, now, uh, uh, in my career, I've used uh, the Kirchhoff uh, summation. You know, it's an integral solution to wave equation uh, uh, reconstruction. Uh, and as you found, as as I asserted, and as you found out how. You know that's a very simple um, ray theory based um, way of constructing wave fields from from sources, um, and uh, that's also not uh, uh, the kind of solution that uh, uh, that Sava and Hill uh, use here. Okay, now also uh, um, uh, Sava uh, and Hill they they cover one. Uh, really, only one wave equation type, the acoustic type. Um, now, if you uh, so that's a, a scalar wave equation, and there's just one you know one equation. Therefore, uh, you know an elastic vector wave equation is really three equations, sometimes more, and um, uh, so they're not covering uh, the elastic uh, types of wave equations. Um, now, the uh, acoustic solution for uh, acoustic waves, uh, which are P waves, um, that has exactly the same mathematical form in, as in a 2D uh, uh, situation. The, um, uh, the scalar uh, wave equation that describes uh, transversely polarized SH waves. So if you have a um, uh, if you have geophones that are uh, uh, sensitive to vibration horizontal vibration that's perpendicular to the line and perpendicular to the uh, uh, direction of wave propagation uh, and is also uh, you also have um, um, SH sources uh, such as a horizontal vibrator that's uh, polarized. Uh, transversely to the to the seismic line, transversely to the 2D section. That also it, it, that takes exactly the same uh, form. It just uh, you know, there's the factors of the uh, it uses the s velocity instead of the p velocity, but really it takes exactly the same form as the um, acoustic uh, wave equation. So really, uh, uh, you could you could process either uh, sh reflections or um, Acoustic reflections with uh, these uh, uh, the, the particular classification that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Sava and Hill are reviewing here. Okay, uh, and and this is one reason that I think uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you several reasons why um, the uh, uh, why reverse time migration is not. Um, well used by people who uh, uh, who want to look at uh, AVO and amplitude uh, in the acoustic wave equation, you can't get close to the uh, the Zobritz equations. All right, I mean, of course, the Zobritz equations are valid for acoustic media, but uh, if we're not recording in the C and the and the shallow, uh, you know shallow muddy sediments, wet sediments, 
then uh, you know, right at the sea bottom. If we're recording on land, especially, then the uh, reflection coefficients, uh, uh, all of the uh, all of the material property changes, really require uh, elastic wave equation work to uh, uh, to get the proper amplitude with. So. Um, uh, that's one reason uh, that uh, classical, at least, uh, uh, reverse time migration is, um, uh, is not thought to be accurate with amplitudes, is that it, it cannot represent the Zopritz equations. Yeah. So why do you have to use the elastic wave equation? Because what if you just use the, the P to P wave solution for the Zopritz equation? I mean, the acoustic wave equation should give you that, right? Uh, but it doesn't because uh, it it depends on you know that that um, uh, just look at the um, uh, the elastic um, uh, the equation for an elastic normal incidence reflection coefficient. Okay, uh, you'll see that uh, if you substitute in uh, mu equals zero for an acoustic medium, you're in trouble. Okay. It doesn't that that you know that's the correct equation for that elastic material, but it doesn't um, uh, it doesn't work for the acoustic case. And the acoustic case is using a, an entirely different you know has to use a different solution to the stresses and the stress continuity at, at each uh, reflector. Is so, there an assumption when you use the uh, acoustic wave equation that mu is zero? Is that an assumption? It's, it's, or not? It, the mu is not even in the. It's not in the equations at all, right? Okay. So it, it works for, uh, yeah. So so I guess that's the assumption. Okay. Um, even though like the P wave velocities depend on mu to some extent. That well, that's the problem. See, uh, see, in in, uh, in an acoustic medium, the P wave velocity depends entirely on k, and the density, of course. Okay. So the you know the the. Uh, mu's not there, and of course, when you break it up into elastic, if you break mu out, then what you have left over is lambda, not k. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's the the two problems are entirely, and the equations are written entirely using different properties. Um, so you just can't expect that the uh, uh, you know that that when you have a RTM based on the um, the acoustic, uh, you know, say finite different solutions of the acoustic wave equation, uh, it's just not going to uh, it's just not going to give you accurate uh, reflection amplitudes. And there's other problems too that I'll that I'll mention as I go along. Okay, so um, uh, now there's uh, in this classification scheme. There's also uh, different types of, of wave field reconstructions that, that, gets, that get used. Okay, so um, and I'm going to cover here uh, uh, at first uh, what seems more familiar to me and more more you know more directly what I think of as reverse time migration. Uh, Sava and Hill call it shot record uh, sequential. Um, uh, or independent uh, migration. There's also survey sinking, uh, which you're familiar with as uh, uh, as uh, downward continuation, and that's uh, a simultaneous um, a simultaneous type of uh, of reverse time migration. Um, really, um, stolt migration is just a, a sort of simple uh, example. Of a simultaneous survey sinking um, uh, a frequency and uh, and uh, um, and spatial frequency domain um, wave field reconstruction. Uh, so uh, you know, Stolt migration, uh, as you know, doesn't do any of the things that you want RTM to do. Um, but if you you know there are ways of, of elaborating it and and using it for uh, as you've seen uh, you know we've seen multi offset Stolt style uh, migrations and uh, uh, there's ways of uh, uh, 
uh, of calling those a, a kind of RTM as well. OK, so then um, you know, there's just these three implementations. Um, so uh, uh, you know, Stolt, uh, Stolt migration uh, would be um, basically uh, simultaneous wave field reconstruction. So it comes to this lower branch and this uh, lower set of uh, eight different uh, implementations. Um, so uh, uh, and Stolt migration is in the frequency domain. It's um, it's actually a mixture of time and, and depth axis uh, um, implementations. Okay, um, and uh, uh, so I think uh, it would probably uh, lie in their classification uh, in this uh, in this you know among the lower eight. It would be uh, in this upper right block here. Um, this is a, uh, a frequency domain one-way migration that uh, I'll mention later. Um, this is um, uh, wave equation migration down here, uh, just extended to multi-offset. Uh, you're familiar with that from the, the WMIG uh, program from the 706 course. Okay, frequency domain, um, depth, um, uh, depth evolution. Okay, WEM is the the uh, uh, what what he uses. Um, let's see. So uh, yeah, Stolt migration is this last one. Well, it's related more related to this last one. Okay, one way in depth survey sinking in the frequency domain. Uh, WEM is uh, uh, using a uh, shot record and uh, uh, sequential uh, one way. Uh, um, uh, one-way evolution of the waves in, in depth, one-way reconstruction, but done in the frequency domain. And then what we know most directly is, as RTM, um, done from uh, shot records, it's a, a two-way wave field evolution in time. You know, two-way means it can go both up and down or left and right. Um, so that would be a uh, acoustic solution to the... Uh, uh, the uh, um, the wave equation, the full wave equation, okay, and also uh, it's in the uh, the time domain, okay, so it's in the time and uh, physical domain, and that's what we we know as RTM. But all these other uh, other things are uh, are quite related. So the uh, Clayton um, the Clayton uh, uh, pre-stack Stolt uh, could be uh, up here, and uh, we could probably you know, figure out where any of the migrations that we uh, are familiar with, uh, um, you know, they're not Kirchhoff. You know, Kirchhoff is off the chart here. Um, we could probably figure out where they belong to. Um, and you're familiar with, uh, uh, you know, paraxial wave equations from 706, okay? And so that's this, uh, these lower tiers of uh, one-way migrations, you know, done in the frequency domain or the, uh, or the, uh, or the time domain. Would one way be exploding reflectors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see. Um, so it just means it's not going down and back up. It's just right, right. Long well, long. well, you can, you know. So uh, uh, if you remember uh, our first look at uh, at multi-offset uh, migration, you know, we uh, we use. Uh, uh, a downgoing uh, wave equation to take the wave from the source to depth, and then uh, you know once it hits the reflector, we use a uh, an upgoing wave to take the, uh, but still paraxial, still one way to take the wave from the reflector up to the uh, up to the receivers. So uh, that's all included here. Let's see where would that be? Uh, so two way would be it goes from the source and the receiver at the same time. Um, Two-way means that it can go both up and down. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, now, now there's a there's a problem with that. It actually, you know, a one-way one-way wave propagation actually matches the assumptions uh, of of RTM better, but it's just much easier to implement it. It seems much more physical to implement it using a two-way wave equation, right? 
Now you can also, you know, create a paraxial wave equation that will only allow, you know, say left or right propagation, right? We used those on the side boundaries earlier for, for W mig and and uh, what was it uh, extract, you know, for those codes uh, from from 706. What was that lab uh, eight? Okay, so. Um, uh, you know, one way is is actually a, in some ways a better um, uh, uh, better fits the uh, the assumptions of the problem, <coughs> but it's uh, 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 and it's also cheaper to calculate. But then then again, uh, you know, uh, it's not that much more expensive to do two way. Uh, you know, full acoustic uh, wave equations, which um, don't necessarily fit, but they uh, um, they're very popular and very easy to understand physically. Okay, so um, you know we got to remind ourselves of of how to build up this. Uh, um, uh, this this very simple example that that Sava and Hill give, you know, is is based on uh, a lot of assumptions, and uh, so then we can figure out how the uh, how the migration works, and then you know later on we could go and and make things more complicated, and get away from uh, from several of these assumptions. Um, so you know just conceptually we're going to start with a two D world. Okay, so our, our physical model just has coordinates x and z, and we have constant velocity, and we have uh, uh, our sources are, are very simple impulses, and they happen at uh, time t equals zero, and they're also at the surface, right, where our sources are, or, or hopefully tend to be, and so they're at z equals zero, and so this red dot here is the the source of a uh, of a wave, which uh, and then you know extending out the uh, the time axis, you know to the back right, um, you you get that familiar cone, you know the Huygen, the familiar Huygens cone, uh, which shows how the wave expands as semicircles in the x z plane, uh, and as a um, a hyperbola, or uh, uh, or uh, you know, very sharp uh, um, triangle in the uh, in in the uh, in planes of constant z. Okay, so very you know, let's just recall this very simple form of of the wave field, um, and, and and you can see that the 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 path we're headed down is purely kinematic. All we're really looking at. Are where these waves are in space and time, um, you know, in x and z and t, and we're not, uh, you know, we're making this this assumption of an impulse source, and thus this, you know, perfectly thin cone, um, you know, which is not a complicated wave. So uh, you know, here again, you can see where we're going to have trouble with amplitude. We're going to have trouble with with uh, frequency content and bandwidth, you know the the, uh, the uh, all the underpinnings of reverse time migration really hold to these uh, this this very kinematic and simplistic view, um, and they don't uh, um, they don't accommodate uh, you know very well um, you know complex ways that that we know that real waves. Uh, uh, evolve their amplitude. Now, just another way of looking at that wave field. Here's the same the same cone, but now we look at it as uh, slices at constant depth, okay, and at all uh, at all time. And you know what those look like? Those are various kinds of hyperbolas, okay. The, and we know those as as diffractions. So. Uh, you know, just a very simple setup to to our, our problem here. Okay, and we can make uh, constant time slices as well. So, 
you know, you in 706, you learn how to extrapolate wave fields from one depth to another, you know, using the simple form of this cone, which is expressed by the dispersion relation, the circular uh, or, con you know, really conical dispersion relation. And we, we learn how to do downward continuation to go from A to B, from one depth to another. And some migrations, like uh, gas egg migration, do that uh, do that explicitly, or uh, or uh, uh, frequency domain migration do that explicitly. Um, there are other uh, 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 ways of of uh, or other directions that one can construct a wave field in. There's the uh, uh, constructing the expanding circle on constant time slices. And, and we didn't do much of this in, in 706. You know, we really looked at that only uh, as kind of a curiosity. Um, but uh, you know, realizing that, that we have these simple uh, solu you know, wave equation solutions for, for wave propagation, in, especially in acoustic media, you know, and you've seen the, uh, now in, in this class, you've, you've seen the, the more complicated uh, wave propagation for you know real and, and complex elastic media. Um, you know the, there's a, the possibility of of constructing our our wave fields, you know, and evolving them in time, starting at t equals zero at the uh, at the time of the the source, and then evolving them in time, uh, you know, all at once uh, going to the next time. For all depths and all all locations x, so that's uh, you know you might think of that as wave propagation. Okay, so um, uh, you know back to our old familiar uh, <coughs> definition of migration as uh, um, as downward continuation plus an imaging condition, but uh, you know Sava and Hill make it clear here that. Really, it's not just downward continuation that we're doing. We might continue wave fields in time alternatively. So uh, really, we're talking about what I would call wave field continuation. Okay, and 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 we're, you know, we're putting those those wave fields into whatever space we need to. You know, two D X and Z and and time, or even three D uh, X. Uh, Y, Z, and uh, and time, and we're talking about continuing those wave fields. So we're, uh, you know, we're we're looking to uh, continue a wave field from the source to a reflection point, and then from a reflection point to a uh, to a receiver. Okay, those are the wave fields we're going to construct, and the reason we're going to construct them is that through our imaging condition. We will get information on on what happens at the uh, at the reflecting point at the reflector. Okay, so you know this uh, migration that we're going to build up in the various implementations, uh, they really have um, two different imaging conditions uh, that I'll I'll detail for you. So the first one is this. Uh, is is what I think of as reverse time migration, and and that's mostly what I have here uh, right now in this uh, in the PowerPoint in the in the current form you have. That's the uh, shot record sequential imaging. Okay, um, and the the second variety, uh, which encompasses Stolt migration and this this frequency domain uh, uh, depth evolving. Uh, Wave field uh, uh, construction um, for uh, simultaneous survey syncing. Okay, uh, you've seen that before in terms of multi-offset. Uh, um, in terms of multi-offset um, Stolt migration, and that used one-way equations. So that multi-offset Stolt migration could be this blue block down here at the lowermost right. Um, and uh, uh, you've seen it before. Uh, um, in uh, uh, in regular Stolt migration as well, um, so that uh, uh, that's uh, uh, useful there too. So let's explore uh, the uh, 
the first kind of imaging condition, which is uh, done on uh, implemented on shot records for uh, sequential imaging. Okay, um, and and the example that the sort of tutorial, you know, material that we have here is for constant velocity. Okay, where it's easy to to see the wave field cones. And uh, you know, there's this uh, figure in the tutorial that uh, we're going to look at bit by bit. Um, and you, uh, we're going to examine uh, the data level, which is here, um, the wave field level, okay, in the middle, uh, and then at the image level, which is down at the bottom. We're going to examine uh, data, wave fields, and images at the source, which is uh, on, or due to the source, which is on the left, and uh, coming into the receiver, which is on the right, in this uh, in this tutorial. Okay, so looking at the uh, uh, at the, the the data. Okay, um, first there's a uh, uh, you know so suspended in this example is this model that generates the data in the middle right here. And uh, what we've got here is a is a 3D world, but it's really 2D because uh, and all all we've got in it here for the tutorial is this flat blue reflector, and then this dipping green reflector, and uh, and then above it is a seismic line that is in the um, in the direction of the dip. So it's really just a 2D uh, a 2D uh, world that we're looking at here. I mean, the waves are always propagating uh, actually in 3D, but uh, uh, we're going to assume that we can represent everything in 2D uh, for uh, simplicity at first. And so, uh, and what we're going to do is, is we're going to examine the data and try to migrate, figure out how to migrate the data from one shot record. Okay. And so the shot record uh, has a, uh, a shot in the middle of the line, that red S there, and then the receivers are uh, on either side of it, so this is a split spread. Okay, we got a 2D survey. It extends in the uh, the cable extends in the x direction. Um, we're looking at just the shot record from the shot right here in the middle. And uh, uh, you know the the Earth model that's down below that is um, is the uh, uh, it just has these two. Uh, uh, simple reflectors. Okay, so in the source domain, we fire an impulsive source at t equals zero, and uh, and at x equals zero. At, at x equals uh, something non-zero in the middle, um, and uh, but it's at z equals zero as well. So uh, this red dot here represents that. Uh, that single source wavelet. Okay. Now, so that's the uh, that's the source uh, as as uh, Sava and Hill are referring to it. The source in the data domain. Okay. And then the receivers in the data domain. Well, we're we're more familiar with those. Okay. We've got uh, notice there's no um, direct waves. Okay. Uh, if there were direct waves, that would be the source in the data domain. But we're assuming the direct waves are not there. Okay, just a thought I, I had. Um, you know, the the real data, as we might call it, is this shot gather. Okay, so here it is in x, and then time is going you know back and to the right. So the 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 shot gather is this horizontal plane here, and it's got two reflections in it. It's got the flat blue one. Which arrives first, except sometimes, you know, at larger offsets, the uh, the uh, um, the green one uh, might uh, uh, arrive first. All right, so that's uh, uh, that's what the data looks like at the receivers. Okay, we've got the impulse data at the source location, and we've got. You know, actually, these lines, of course, are just lines of impulses at the various times that the reflections arrive at the receivers. Uh, they're still, you know, impulsive waves. Nothing complicated about the amplitude or uh, 
uh, or the uh, um, nothing complicated about the the uh, the amplitude or the phase of the or the shape of the waves. Okay, so you know all these all these assumptions are uh, you know right so far still infinite bandwidth. Okay, so. Um, uh, one of the one of the critical leaps that uh, that Sava and, and Hill make, uh, which is is uh, I'm still grappling with it, is that the this data plane in X and T, you know, it's a separate one at the source <coughs> as it is for the receiver. <coughs> so there's uh, there's an impulse just at the source, okay. And there's a source data plane, and it's different from the receiver data planes. Data planes. Okay, well, each shot gather is a receiver data plane, and it's got all these impulses lined up along these hyperbolas, as we would expect. Okay, but there's really no fundamental difference between the the data at the source and the data at the receiver. And I think the thing I missed uh, uh, on the first reading of this tutorial. Is that these these reflected amplitudes, you know, that that create these uh, these hyperbolas? Well, these hyperbolas are just lined up red dots, lined up impulses. Okay, so I think that's critical to understanding the uh, uh, this uh, uh, this tutorial. Okay, so now we move on to uh, uh, looking at at D. Okay, which is uh, now the uh, the wave field. Okay, so what's the form of the wave field? Well, we've got uh, uh, and and this is really an exploding reflector view. Okay, so at um, uh, each of these uh, each of these uh, hyperbolas, if I go to the 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 uh, uh, the last slide. Uh, each of these hyperbolas, right? Well, that's a section of a of a cone. Okay, and where does that cone come from? Where the cone has its apex, you know, at a at a reflecting point that is uh, um, that is you know here's the the blue reflecting point is a point on the you know it's at it's at some non-zero depth. Uh, where the uh, the blue reflector is, okay, and it's at a certain point, um, which you know here should be right under the source, okay. Now the green one is is displaced because of the the dip because its its normal reflection, you know, this normal reflecting point is up dip of the uh, of the midpoint and up dip of the source, okay. So um, uh, yeah, up dip of the source location, and it's also from deeper because it's from that deeper green dipping reflector, and so there's its point, and so uh, you have a uh, a source at these different x and z combinations, you know, on the reflectors, so they're they're acting like exploding reflectors, okay, and you expand them and uh, you project these cones up to zero depth, and there you have the hyperbolas. That are in the in the shot record. Okay. Now you you got to do the same thing with the source. So that that source is that point there, at uh, you know, and there's nothing there but the source in the data plane. But you reconstruct the wave field, and of course, what you're going to do is just expand the source as it really did. You know, in the field, the source is going to expand into a cone. You know, which is a semicircle. Uh, you know, all the all the constant time sections of the cone are semicircles, and so the red source uh, uh, cone expands, and then we have the uh, the blue and green exploding reflector cones expanding. Okay. John, uh, I'm having a little trouble understanding the blue and the green cones. We're shooting down at a plane, so where do we get a cone? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, will you agree that um, uh, you know from a from this uh, uh, from this one shot in the shot gather, um, you're going to see uh, you're going to see hyperbolas, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and and so then uh, will you agree with me that the um, that the hyperbolas are um, uh, the hyperbolas um, are sections of a cone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so all we're all we're doing here is we're we're taking that those hyperbolas and we're reconstructing the cone that they are sections of, right? And especially that's easy in constant velocity, right? Just uses the the dispersion relation. Right, so however we do that, we reconstruct the cone, okay, and then where does it, uh, you know, if the uh, and then where do those, okay, so if if the apexes of the cones, the points of the cones, were at the surface, were at z equals zero, what would the hyperbolas in the data look like? Triangles. Yeah, and they don't, right? I mean, they're from these. So, so where must the these apexes be? They've got to be on the reflectors, right? So that hyperbola line is enough to uniquely determine the cone in three D. Yes. Well, well, you know, the the big qualifier is you got to know the velocity, right? Mm -hmm. But if you know the velocity, okay, right, then you can reconstruct the you can reconstruct the cone. From that hyperbolic section, if you know the velocity. Okay. okay. Now, um, again, this is uh, um, this is this is purely kinematic, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're reconstructing these these services of constant phase, and or or these arrival time services. You know. Are we? Are we? Even if we know the velocity, are we going to be able to to uh, perfectly construct how amplitude evolves through that cone? No. That's a different problem entirely, and we're not we're not solving that. Yeah. All those cones are right. Is that's just Higgins' principle for a point scatter, right? Oh yeah. Any point scatter is going to shoot out energy in a cone, right? Right. Right. And so if it, if it's sunken below the surface. Then the slice at the surface will look like a hyperbola. Exactly. And then when it's at the source, because that is at the, the surface, then it looks like a, like a V, right? Yep. Yep. But anytime you sink it, you're gonna get the hyperbola. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The hyperbola is the you know off center section of the cone. Uh, as we yeah, as we saw early in seven oh six. Uh well no, midway through seven oh six. Uh so those those two reflectors in the shot record are just going to become a point. Well, we're going to reconstruct that those, you know. No, we're we're actually we're actually taking the data right, and we're 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 constructing the whole cone. Uh -huh. But it is to find the point, the apex of the of the cone. You know that is the right because where are these? Where are these? Well, those are in the image plane, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so that's very important, but that's not actually where we where we use it. Where we use it is is you know right here in the data. But we gotta we gotta reconstruct that uh, that cone. Um. Now, where are the where are the points, right? Um. I believe it didn't say so. Uh, 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 Sava and Hill don't say, but I believe that um, you know on the on the flat reflector, this point is 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 directly below the source. Okay, so that would be the normal reflection point from that source, and and this one would be the normal reflection point from the same source, and it's not directly under the source because it comes from a dipping reflector, mm -hmm. and that's just a very you know, very natural explanation of, of how these cone, you know, you have these hyperbolas, and when you reconstruct the cones, that's what you get. 
And all you have to do is reconstruct the cone. OK, so, so we've, we've uh, all right, tomorrow I will reveal what happens next. We've, we've reconstructed the source cone. We, we have a wave field from the source, and we have a wave field from the shot record. I mean, how crazy is that? Now, what do we do with those two? OK, we're not going to just, we're not going to take the shot record and, uh, uh, and look at these two points, right? I mean, we, OK, we've reconstructed these two points in the section, and we've, re we've reconstructed the, uh, the, um, the normal reflection points. Well, that doesn't really gain us anything. Yeah, question. I was going to say, just a quick question. They assume that that source wave field just continues out linearly like that? Like it doesn't, uh, like they don't consider any reflections, right? They just consider it just goes out perfectly like that cone. They look at everything that reflects from those scatters. Yes, that is, a, that is fundamental to this. Uh, and, and that's what I think is one of the big failings of RTM. Is that <clears throat> all this? Notice that that this wave field reconstruction does not allow any any other um, reflections. All this wave field reconstruction is perfectly reflection diffraction free, right? And 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 here, you know, okay, so easy to do in constant velocity, you know, with the simple circular dispersion relation. Uh -huh. But not very physically realistic, right? It also doesn't factor in like any multiples at all, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So certainly no multiple reflections. No refractions. No, none. You know, none of that. None <laughs> of that. The only way that the only way that green could arrive sooner than the blue is if it's a reflected refraction. So it, it would have to be a refraction. Yeah, there there could be a problem with this diagram in that way, because uh -huh. yeah, I don't right. I don't. I don't see how how you get the data as it is, but we'll have to we'll have to question that more tomorrow uh, tomorrow.